So uh, this, this, this lecture series, uh, the Simon's presentation lecture series theme is on waves. Um, and uh, I haven't actually worked on waves directly for, for a few years, but uh, I thought I would sort of give a survey of uh, some of the things that are going on in the mathematical theory of waves, uh, particularly in um, the area of harmonic analysis, which is where, where um, I come from. Um, although I won't be super technical, there will be some equations in this talk, but, uh, and one proof, but, uh, but not, uh, uh, you know, I realize this, this, many of the audience here are not professional mathematicians, so uh, I'll try to be somewhat uh, non-technical. Okay, so um, waves, of course, you're all familiar with. There are uh, many, many waves you see in physics. Um, so sound waves, light waves, and water waves are, are very, very familiar to us. And then there's also gravity waves and plasma waves and all kinds of other uh, more esoteric uh, ways out there. This is, of course, the most famous picture, uh, art uh, description of our wave here. Uh, the great wave of Kamigawa, I think, by Hokusai. Um, in mathematics, we describe waves by partial differential equations. Um, and there are dozens and dozens of um, wave equations out there. Um, and I'm not going to, to list them all. Um, but I just want to show you uh, what two of them look like, at least to a mathematician. Um, so the way, um, so some of the, the, the two most basic equations, wave equations that we study, uh, one is called the wave equation, uh, or the free wave equation. Um, and uh, it is what, for example, sound waves or, um, or water waves are to a first approximation. Um, and so there, uh, there's a, a scalar field, um, U. Um, so it might, if it's a water wave, it might just be to the amplitude of water uh, on, on a two-dimensional surface. Um, oh, hey. Um, or um, uh, if it's a sound wave in three dimensions, then uh, it, it, is, uh, it would be working in three dimensions. And it's a double time derivative of u equals uh, the passing of u. Um, and then another important uh, basic equation is the Schrodinger equation, which describes quantum uh, waves of, uh, um, wave functions of one particle. Uh, and it's very similar, except that now the wave function is is complex valued rather than real, uh, and you stick an i in here, and there's only one time derivative instead of two, but basically uh, a very similar equation, at least algebraically. Um, if you work in the sciences, maybe you don't write the equations this way. You might see a few more c's and h bars and two m's and so forth. Um, yeah, so mathematicians, we con by convention, we often normalize all those interesting physical constants to one, uh, so you don't see them. Um, and of course, in, in the real world, the world is three-dimensional, uh, but we often, uh, in mathematics, we like um, varying the dimension, um, not just for sake of generality, but um, often just to vary the, the difficulty. So a lot of these problems are uh, in a certain dimension, like three dimensions might be too difficult or too easy to study. Um, and so it's a, it's a convenient parameter to, 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 to modify to, um, uh, to get to a, a question where somehow uh, you can make interesting progress. You know, in mathematics, you always want to work on questions that are just barely outside of uh, the range of sort of known techniques, uh, because then you have a chance of making progress and advancing the field. If it's if it's too easy, you know, if you, you don't learn anything, and it's too hard, you, you also don't learn anything. Um, now, these are the two simplest models. As I said, there are dozens and dozens of other equations that are more physically um, realistic. Um, but generally speaking, you have no hope of understanding the difficult models unless you first understand the simple models, like the free wave equation, free Schrodinger equation. And even for these most basic models, there are still questions. I mean, we're, we're making a lot of progress, but actually there's still questions we don't fully answer. We don't fully know the answer to, uh, even for these basic models. Uh, but uh, but they're, they're often the first step. Uh, you can use things like perturbation theory uh, often to understand, uh, say, nonlinear versions of these equations once you understand the linear version. Okay, um, so there's lots and lots of topics in the mathematical theory of waves, and there's no way I can summarize everything that's going on. Um, and there are already several talks in this series actually covering various aspects um, of wave equations. Um, but one um, theme, I think, which is uh, common, at least in the mathemat mathematical study of waves, is that uh, Waves, as opposed to other equations like the heat equations or, or transport equations or, or whatever, um, there are, uh, they exhibit two phenomena which kind of fight each other. Um, and I, this sort of tension between these two phenomena I, I find fascinating, um, about waves in particular. Um, so the first is, is energy conservation. That, that waves, at least ideal waves where there's no friction, um, they conserve energy. Um, so energy is neither created nor destroyed in um, you know, um, in, uh, in, a, in um, a system modeled by a wave equation. Um, 
And it's not just energy. There's a couple of other energy type quantities that are also preserved. Um, so that's one feature of um, wave equations. Um, um, the technical uh, and uh, if, uh, the more technical term is that these are Hamiltonian equations. Um, but then the other thing which is kind of fighting this conservation uh, of energy is that they also like to decay. Um, that, that, that waves tend to get um, they tend to diminish as time uh, advances. Um, and these two facts are kind of contradictory. How can something be both conserved and decay? Um, and quantifying exactly how these two uh, phenomena sort of interplay with each other, that, that's really, I, I find that kind of a common theme um, in the subject. Although formalizing exactly what that means, uh, you kind of lose this intuition and you, you just see lots and lots of math. But, uh, but this, I think, is the, uh, uh, sort of the basic fundamental feature of waves. OK, so let's talk about energy conservation first. Um, Nice quote by Isaac Asimov, um, which I quite like. Yeah, the law of conservation of energy tells us you can't get something for nothing, but we refuse to believe it. Um, it is a very unintuitive uh, um, law, actually. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, it took a while after Newton, actually, to figure out even that energy was a thing um, and that it was conserved. Uh, it's like energy is, is, you know, unlike, say, mass or something, it's, it's not something that you can really kind of measure and touch directly. Um, but it is an important law uh, that, that physical systems have. Um, and so, as I said, um, these idealized wave equations, like the free Schrodinger equation, free, free Schrodinger equation, they have no friction, no dissipation, no interaction with, with external forces or other, um, other particles. Um, so, you know, as we learn in, um, in, in our physics classes, whenever you have a closed system um, with, without these uh, dissipative forces, we expect energy to be, to be conserved. Um, so mathematically, what that means is that there'll be some quantity called, um, so at any time, so your solution, uh, your wave is called U, and at every time t, there is uh, your wave has a certain profile, u of t. Um, and so uh, u of 0 is the initial um, state of the wave, and u of t is the state at some later time. Uh, and at every state of the wave can, gets assigned some number called the energy. There's an, there's an energy that you can assign to, um, to the wave at any given time. And the law of conservation of energy says that the energy at time t is always equal to the energy at time 0. Um, and so, I mean, the powerful thing is that this is true for all time t. So it doesn't matter what kind of interactions go on. You know, you can have extremely complicated dynamics, but, but um, no matter what you do, you must always keep this energy uh, conserved. Um, it's not always energy. As I said, there are also conservation of mass sometimes, or, or in, in the case of, of the Schrodinger equation, conservation of probability. Um, yeah, so the energy in, for waves tends to take uh, various integrated forms. Um, so... Um, uh, when, when, you, when you strip out all the physical constants, for example, the energy of a free wave uh, takes a form like this. It's the integral of the surface energy, which uh, is basically the square integral of the, of the gradient of you. It, measures the, it comes from surface tension of the wave. Um, and then there's also the kinetic energy, half mv squared, uh, but because we've normalized mv1, oops, uh, you just see the, uh, the one half and then the time derivative of u, which is the, the velocity um, of the wave. OK, so that is what energy looks like for the wave equation. Um, and there's a similar formula for the uh, energy of a, uh, of a free Schrodinger particle. Uh, it's just down there. And again, uh, the h bars and m's and so forth have been, have been suppressed. Um, but also, the total, um, the, um, the, uh, by Born's law, the, the square of, of the wave function is the probability density. And the probability that your particle is somewhere is always 1. OK, so, so the total probability is always also conserved. OK. Um, so these are what conserved quantities look like. Um, so why do we have conserved quantities at all? I mean, this is, uh, uh, it's not intuitive, you know, and people spend lots and lots of time trying to build, like, you know, perpetual motion machines and things trying to defeat the law of conservation of energy. Because um, it, it isn't really an intuitive law. Um, I mean, people are either naturally kind of optimists, they think that things get better over time, or, or pessimists, they think it gets worse over time. But things, the, the, the idea that things get are conserved over time is somehow not, uh, not really intuitive. Um, but it is a general phenomenon um, that pretty much any physical system um, actually has lots and lots of conservation laws. And so this, it, it, it comes from a, um, a really fundamental theorem of, um, uh, so this was explained by Emmy Noether. So Emmy Noether has a, her famous Noether's theorem, uh, which says that every time you have a, a physical system uh, and it has some sort of symmetry attached to it, uh, more precisely a continuous symmetry, um, um, then it, it must, uh, it, uh, your, your equation must come with a conservation law. And in fact, it's kind of a converse to every conservation law comes with a symmetry. Um, so this is fundamental and not intuitive connection between um, conservation and symmetry. 
Um, so I thought I'd actually prove notice theorem. Um, like this, this is something which you know you 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 might see it in a calculus of variations class or something, and it's called this horrible derivation. Um, but there's actually um, um, a very nice conceptual proof. Um, oh, hang on, I'll, I'll get to that in the next slide. Um, yeah, so, uh, so first of all, this is asterisk uh, about physical system. Okay, so, so not every, you've got an arbitrary equation. Um, usually nothing's conserved. Uh, but it's only the physical equations that, that get uh, conservation laws. Um, and physical uh, as a technical meaning. It, it means that, that either you obey classical mechanics, uh, you know, um, Newton's laws, Hamilton mechanics, and the Lagrangian mechanics, or you obey quantum mechanics, uh, Schrodinger's laws and Heisenberg's law. Um, for both of those, we have notice theorem. Okay, but for anything else, you don't, pretty much. Um, but then every, but uh, once you have notice theorem, you've got this great dictionary. Every time your, your system has some symmetry, it, it creates a conserved quantity. Um, so here's, here's some, some examples. You know, so if your system, for example, is what's called spatially translation invariant, which means that if you take your, your a solution to, to a wave equation and you just move it in space somewhere else, it still solves the same equation. Um, so so um, if your equation doesn't privilege one location in space over another, it has spatial translation invariance. And notice theorem tells you that every time that happens, uh, you have a conservation of momentum. If you have rotation symmetry, you conserve angular momentum. If you have a what's called phase rotation symmetry, you conserve total probability. You have gauge transforms, you conserve charge. If you're invariant, if you have if your equations are time translation invariant, they don't privilege time zero of any other time. Uh, then that's where uh, energy conservation comes from. And then there's a really fancy symmetry that sort of contains all the previous ones to some extent. Um, uh, the principle of general relativity says that, that the laws of physics should look the same in every single in reference frame, even the non-inertial ones. And that leads to actually a point-wise conservation of uh, concentration of stress energy, which is sort of in some sense stronger than, than most of the previous ones. Uh, but we won't talk about that one. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I want to give one proof in this talk, and it's a proof of Noether's theorem. Uh, I don't know how well known it is. It's, it's, it's a proof, um, I learned it from this lecture of, of Richard Feynman, uh, who gives famously good lectures, uh, used to give famously good lectures. Um, um, and so, uh, and it's a proof, I mean, it, it's, it's almost a proof by picture. I mean, there's, you have to accept a few things on faith. Uh, but, uh, okay, so it, in case you haven't seen it, I'm just going to show you why symmetry and, um, and conservation are so tight, tightly in, interwound. Okay, so um, all physical systems, you know, Hamiltonian, like from classical mechanics or quantum mechanics, they are all what's called Lagrangian. Um, they obey a vari variational principle, uh, sometimes known as the principle of least action. So for every one of these equations, there is some complicated quantity called the action, um, and it's some big space-time integral of, 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 of your wave. And um, solutions to wave equations are, tried to, are always trying to minimize uh, this action. Uh, actually, technically, that they are stationary points from the action, which are a slightly different thing being, being minima, but you can think of it as being, being minimizes. Um, maybe the, the, uh, the version of this that you may have seen, uh, maybe even in high school, um, is Fermat's principle of least time, which he used to try to explain the behavior of optics. Um, that if you look at, at the behavior of light, uh, think of it as a particle, a uh, photon, from trying to get from A to B, uh, photons will always try to, to take the path that minimizes the time um, to get from A to B. Um, and this is why, for example, when there's a mirror, um, angle of incidence is angle of reflection, because that is actually the, uh, mathematically, that's the path that will, that will minimize um, the time, at least locally. Of course, globally, this is, you could go straight, but locally, um, that's, that's, that's the minimizer. Uh, also, it explains uh, Snell's law of refraction. If you, if you pass from, from air to glass, um, you bend, and, and the bend is exactly what's needed to minimize uh, the time of, of transit. Um, so, um, all right, so, so that is one very famous example of a variational principle. Okay? And it turns out that all waves, of course, you know, we now know that light is an electromagnetic wave, but in fact, all waves obey uh, a principle of least action. Uh, it's just different wave, different wave equations have different actions. And I'm not actually going to write down any of these actions. Um, I mean, you, you can, but it won't really eliminate anything. It's actually not important to the proof. Um, all right. So uh, mathematically, what does being stationary for the action mean? So uh, you can think about way, mathematically, uh, so the, the great thing about mathematics is that yeah, you, you can, uh, well, first of all, you can, you can do diagrams and, and they can mean whatever you want. Um, so um, um, the x-axis here is uh, what's called um, state space. Um, so, so uh, uh, these are all the possible states of waves uh, at a given time. Um, and this is an infinite rational space because waves have infinite many degrees of freedom. So, uh, so this line, 
Uh, this line here is actually denoting an infinite dimensional space, but to a mathematician, that's completely fine. Um, so at any given time, uh, your wave is just one point in this state space. Um, and then what, what a wave is, is some trajectory over time. Yeah, so the vertical axis is time. Um, so at, the, at some initial time, you're at some initial state, and then your wave does something, and then, and then you end up at some, fin at some final time. So you can think of a wave as some curve in an infinite dimensional space. Um, and what being um, stationary means, uh, minimizing the action, the action is normally called L, L for Lagrangian, is that if you take your actual trajectory, so this is the actual uh, path of, um, of your solution, and then you take any competing trajectory, so uh, if you take some other possible uh, behavioral wave that doesn't solve your equation, but it has the same initial and start, it's, it starts at the same state and ends at the, at the final state, but it does something um, close to, but not exactly the same. Um, uh, the principle of these actions is that your actual solution U is a stationary point of the Lagrangian, which means that any nearby perturbation has almost the same Lagrangian as, the, as, 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 as your original Lagrangian to first order. To second order, there'll be a little bit of a, of a correction. But, but um, to, as a first approximation, um, changing the trajectory of your solution doesn't actually change your path much. That's like if you go in a straight line from A to B, it, 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 any slight perturbation of a straight line has almost, it takes almost the same distance. Okay, because of Pythagorean theorem. All right, so that's the principle of least action, um, but it only works uh, if uh, it's, it's you only are a minima um, searching point if you fix both the starting point and the final point. If you don't fix the starting point and and the final point, so that uh, if if you have a competing state which is slightly perturbed initially from your initial state by some perturbation, and also partly perturbed at the final time, then your uh, the Lagrangian of your perturbed solution is not is no longer close, is no longer as close to the Lagrangian of your initial solution. There'll be correction terms coming from the perturbation of the um, um, of the initial state and the perturbation of, 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 of the of the final state, and you can work out what those correction terms are by calculus. Okay, so uh, basically you apply a very fancy, well, an infinite dimensional chain rule. Okay, but you, you apply the chain rule uh, and also an integration by parts, but um, but basically, uh, you can generalize. So once you know that you're already stationary, uh, when when the um, endpoints are fixed, once the endpoints are moving, you are stationary up to a correction. You can show that if if you perturb your solution. I'm sorry. Uh, this is this is one slide too far. Okay. Uh, yeah. If you perturb your solution, um, then your uh, your new Lagrangian is equal is approximately the old Lagrangian, plus a perturbation that depends only on what you've done at, at time zero. Uh, and also, um, and, uh, a comp uh, well, it's actually going to be a difference. There's, a, there's an integration of parts that shows you that it's actually going to be a, uh, a difference between a, a, um, a change coming from, from what you did uh, at time t and what you did at time zero. And so the, uh, if you actually work out what the chain rule gives you, um, the, um, the change in the Lagrangian is just given by, by um, the difference of, of two quantities coming from the, the perturbations at the endpoints. And what's going on in the middle doesn't matter because it's stationary. Okay, so that's, that's what calculus gives you. But on the other hand, what symmetry gives you is that uh, if your equation is a symmetry, so as I said, like if you, have trans if you have translation symmetry, that means you take your wave and you move it by, by some amount. It has, this, it's this, it's the same, it, has, it has the same dynamics, you have the same Lagrangian. So if you, if you apply a symmetry, a continuous symmetry um, to your wave, just, you just perturb it a little bit, like translate it or rotate it a little bit, it will have the same Lagrangian. As, um, as, as, as what you start with, that, that's, that's, that's part of, of the symmetry. So on the one hand, symmetry gives you the Lagrangian doesn't change, and on the other hand, calculus tells you that the Lagrangian does change by an amount depending on the difference between some quantity at time t and some quantity at time zero. And so in order for both things to be true, this quantity at time t must equal the quantity at time zero. And that's the conservation law. Okay, so this is notice here. This is, uh, um, okay, I don't know, I mean, um, if you've seen the, the textbook proof of this, you will appreciate this proof. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this, this, is, uh, this, is Feynman, this was Feynman's proof. Anyway, I just want to show it just to show it. The one proof I have in, the, in, the, in, this, in this slide. Okay. All right. Um, it's not the only way that you can view energy um, conservation. So um, there are many other ways to, to see why things conserve energy. Um, so uh, a basic way is through Fourier analysis, which is a very uh, important tool to study all these equations. Um, so Fourier analysis tells you that any wave can be written as a superposition of uh, plane waves. So plane waves are uh, just sines and cosines type waves that, that, uh, that go on forever. Um, they, they're not localized. They, 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 are, they are extremely um, boring. Um, uh, they're, they're extremely, about the simplest example of a wave that actually waves. Um, and um, so every uh, 
Um, so Fourier nonsensitivity is every wave can be super, can be written as a superposition of plane waves. It's a it's a continuous superposition, not a discrete superposition, but still it's, it's a superposition. And the two model equations I gave you are linear. Um, so if you understand what what plane waves do, you in principle understand what what arbitrary waves do. Um, but plane waves uh, actually um, have, have very simple dynamics. Okay, so th this this I, I stole this image from uh, a website, which I was hoping to actually get the animation, but my PDF doesn't do that. Um, so uh, the, the actual image uh, has, an, has an animated wave. Okay, so if, if, if you evolve the wave equation here, you know it, the wave just travels at a constant velocity. So in particular, it doesn't uh, change its energy. Its energy is conserved. Um, of course, in a way, that's kind of, uh, in a sense, that's, that's vacuous because plane waves have infinite energy. Um, but uh, there's a way in which um, you can sensibly say that plane waves conserve energy, and general waves are superpositions of plane waves. And then uh, there's one other extra thing you need to do because you need to relate the energy of a superposition to the energy of your of your components, uh, and you need something like Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, and we, but uh, the continu a continuous version. Uh, but there is a continuous version of Pythagoras' theorem it's called Planck-Jones theorem, which I will not talk about. Um, but it's it's one of the basic theorems of Fourier analysis. And so basically, once you understand, what, because plane waves obey um, conserve energy, and because energy obeys Planck-Jones theorem, uh, you can show that that the energy is conserved for all waves. Okay, so this so you can so you can see energy conservation both from general no theory and principles or from Fourier analysis, and they're both important perspectives. Okay, um, so then the other thing is time decay. Um, so um, yeah, okay, this is a um, time decay waste. I, I, I like this. There's a poem called The Heron, and this is this is. The, uh, the quote I used in my, in my, I wrote a textbook on PD actually, and this is the quote I used to actually illustrate the concept of, uh, of time decay. Uh, yeah, uh, the wide wings flap once, but to lift them up, it's a single ripple starts from where he stood. Um, of course, nowadays I can actually illustrate this quote. I, I put it in the Jack GBT and gave me this lovely image. Okay. All right. Um, so. Um, yeah, so the, the, the time decay is something that we uh, are very familiar with. You know, throw a pebble in a, in a pond, or you, can, you wait for a heron to, to, to leave the pond, and there'll be a splash. Okay, but the amplitude of your splash will eventually um, decay over time. Um, and there's various ways to see this. Um, it's a bit hard to see from Fourier analysis, and it's also a bit hard to see from Noetherian no principles, but you can see it from something else. Um, so these waves also come, wave equations also come with something called a fundamental solution. Uh, which is a way of explicitly writing your solution at a later time in terms of the solution at, at the initial time. It's, uh, in a sense, it's an explicit formula, but, but even just having, a, just because you have a formula for something doesn't necessarily mean you understand it. Um, but uh, it, it still, it's a useful, it's a useful thing to have. Uh, so, for example, for the Schrodinger equation, uh, this is um, the fundamental solution for the, uh, the Schrodinger equation. It tells you that it, it, it's an explicit integral formula for the, um, the solution at time t in terms of the solution at time zero, integ integrated against various things. Um, but the only thing I wanted to put your attention to is that there's a new denominator here, t to the dimension over two. Um, and so just from, from that factor alone, uh, as the dimension gets bigger, as, as time gets bigger, um, that uh, this, this integral is going to get smaller, and so you expect solutions to, to decay in amplitude as time progresses. Uh, and in fact, the bigger the dimension, the more, uh, dis, uh, the more decay you should expect. Uh, and the, there's a, a similar but more complicated formula for the wave equation. Okay, um, so we, we have this, this time decay as well. Um, yeah, so this is kind of paradoxical though. So, you know, so on the one hand, um, waves are supposed to conserve their energy. Okay, so, the, so in some sense, they, they should look the same at later times as they do at, at initial, initial times. But on the other hand, they're supposed to decay in time. They're supposed to have lower, smaller amplitude at later times than they do at initial times. Uh, and that, that seems um, contradictory. Um, uh, it also contradicts time reversal symmetry. These, these equations, in addition to having time translation symmetry, they also have a time reversal symmetry. If you reflect um, a, a wave in time, it, it, uh, uh, you know, if, you take, if you videotape a wave and you, and you, and you view it in reverse, it actually, it's, it's, it's a perfectly physically reasonable wave, assuming there's no friction and so forth. Um, you know, but whereas time decay some, it feels like it's a very time asymmetric phenomenon. Right? Um, uh, if you reverse a, a wave where, where the amplitude is decaying, you should get a wave where amplitude is increasing. So, you know, so somehow, on the one hand, conservation laws and time reversal symmetry tell you there's no arrow of time, whereas time decay tells you there's an arrow of time. So what's, what's going on? Um, so, of course, there is no paradox. We understand this. Um, oh, yeah, so I first decided, okay, since I played with ChatGPT, um, 
I, I was I was curious to see what it would do to to ex explain at least in, in pictorial form what the conflict was between energy decay and dispersion. Um, I'll leave it to you two to judge whether this is uh, 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 actually adds anything to the discussion. But uh, okay, anyway, I, I thought this was a, a nice image that came out. Anyway, um, all right. Uh, there's a lot of uh, ChatGPT rejects actually that did not make it to this uh, this uh, this, uh, this talk. Okay, it's uh, but anyway. Um, okay, so so how is time decay and energy? Or why 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 are they not uh, incompatible? Um, so there's basically two features of waves that kind of resolve um, the conflict. Um, so the first is, is what's called dispersion. Um, so uh, dispersion is the fact that, that waves of different frequency actually travel at different velocities. And, so, um, and because of this, waves tend to diverge over time. So if a wave is localized at, at some initial time, it will have many different frequencies um, um, because of the uncertainty principle. Actually, the more you localize, the more frequency uncertainty there is. Um, and so you also, you also get more velocity uncertainty. So the more you localize as a wave in, in space, the more it will diverge over time because the different components, the different frequency components of your wave will start moving in different directions. So you, you can, um, uh, with, uh, uh, so you can actually use Fourier analysis actually to explain dispersion quite well. We understand that now. Um, so that's one reason why we have time decay. But we have time decay only because initially you are localized. You know, with a picture of the heron, the, the reason why you time decay is because at, that at initial time the wave was completely localized to the heron's toe. Um, so. Um, what time decay actually is, it's a trade-off. Um, localization gets converted into decay. But, uh, it, uh, but we also have time reversibility. Um, you can also uh, have the opposite phenomenon. You can have dispersed waves focusing to a single point. Um, if you imagine a videotape of a heron taking off and leaving ripples, and you reverse it, you could have a whole bunch of ripples come converging you know, into a single point where it, it, it would explode. And that is a perfectly good solution to a wave equation. You don't see it much in, in, in real life, but mathematically, it is a perfectly valid solution. So um, because of just, so uh, two sides of the same coin, every time you're dispersion, you also have the, you also are focusing. It is, it is possible for a dispersed wave to, to focus all the energy at, at one point. So in all these cases, energy is conserved. So sometimes the energy is focused at one point with high amplitude or it's spread out with low amplitude. So the energy is always the same, but there's a trade-off between amplitude and, um, uh, and dispersion. And the question is, is sort of exactly what type of trade-offs are possible. Uh, like, uh, um, you know, how long can a wave maintain its focus before having to disperse, and so forth. Okay, so um, just because you know energy is, is conserved, that's an important initial fact ab about waves. But but um, how the energy is distributed over time uh, is that's a, that's a question that's not fully answered by energy conservation. And these sort of effects, uh, they can occur over long times or, or short times. Uh, these equations also have scale invariance. Uh, once you know what a solution is doing at, at one time, you can rescale it and you get other solutions that do things at other times. So um, uh, like these focusing effects can either happen um, uh, at large time scales and low frequencies, um, and this is what gives to rise to time decay or lack of time decay, or it can uh, take, uh, it, it, can, it, can, um, it can happen at, over short periods of time at high frequencies. Um, and then focusing gets manifested as, as a lack of smoothing, what's called a loss of derivatives in, in, in mathematics. Um, but time decay and loss of derivatives uh, are the kind of, again, two sides of the same coin, they're kind of rescalings of each other. All right. Um, yeah, so I talk about dispersion. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, what, so where, time, where decay really comes from is dispersion. And, um, and specifically, all these equations, uh, just the, the geometric nature of these equations, uh, each of them has a dispersion relation, um, and di different wave equations have, have, have different relations. But all wave equations that we, that uh, show up in nature have a fundamental dispersion relation that relates the velocity of a plane wave. Okay, more, more technically, the group velocity but, um, of a plane wave uh, with its spatial frequency. Um, so frequency is some vector just describing um, how fast the wave is oscillating and in which direction, and um, frequency always influences velocity. Um, and if you change your frequency, you will change the velocity, and this is why you have dispersion. Um, but as I said, different equations have different uh, uh, dispersive laws. Um, for uh, quantum mechanics, Schrodinger's equation, the uh, dispersive law is given by de Broglie's law, which is the lesser known cousin of Planck's law, which somehow is much more famous. Uh, Planck's law is saying that energy is quantized um, by time frequency. Uh, uh, de Broglie's law is, is, um, is the same law, actually. It's the momentum is quantized by, by spatial frequency. Okay, by relativity, they're the same law, but some, for some reason, Planck still gets all the press. Um, 
Yeah, so the momentum is actually, well, on the one hand, it's, it's, it's the velocity times a constant, the mass, but it's also uh, the frequency times a constant, you know, Planck's constant. Um, and, uh, uh, okay, uh, the way we've normalized, actually, uh, it's, it's simpler. The velocity is actually just twice the, uh, the frequency. Uh, yeah, so clearly different frequencies have give different velocities. Uh, for the wave equation, um, the dispersion relation is a little bit different. Um, waves always travel at the speed of the wave. Uh, so if it's a light wave or electromagnetic wave, it will travel at the speed of light C. Um, um, uh, but the direction in which the wave um, uh, uh, travels depends on the frequency. So uh, 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 the, the speed is C, but the velocity is C times the direction of the frequency. So a plane wave that's pointing that's point in this direction will propagate in this direction, or, or maybe actually, in the, well, it, it depends on, uh, it, it will propagate either forward or backwards in time. Uh, yeah, I guess there's a plus or minus that I, sh I should have thought that to be completely accurate. Um, and for the way, I've, the way I've written it, actually C is normalized to one, so you don't actually see C. All right, but anyway, but again, it depends on, on the velocity, on the frequency, different frequencies, different velocities, and this is what causes dispersion. Um, waves, uh, the wave equation has a little bit less dispersion than the Schrodinger equation because uh, waves that point in the same direction um, move in the same direction, so there's, there's no dispersion in the um, longitudinal direction. There's only sort of uh, transverse dispersion, but there's still quite a bit of dispersion, especially in high, in high dimensions. In one dimension, there's no dispersion. That's why you can get these standing waves, you know, you can give the jump rope or something. Um, and that's why we have string instruments. Okay. Um, right. So, um, um, as I said, the flip side of dispersion is focusing. If you time reverse a dispersive effect, you get a focusing effect. So waves, which are very spread out at some time, can focus um, at, um, at in all the energy into one point at some later time. Um, and if... if, if uh, if your wave is high frequency, this, this can happen quite quickly, and so, and so very quickly you can get um, a lot of high frequency energy at one point, and this is, this is uh, reflected mathematically in what's called a loss of regularity of your solution if you measure it in certain Sobolev norms. But, um, so there's a, um, for any given time, you can, you can have a, a lot of, of, of loss of regularity. This is in contrast to other basic equations of physics, like the heat equation, where there's lots and lots of smoothing. Um, but wave equations are not smoothing. Um, they, you can lose... Um, a lot of regularity at any given time. But focusing is very transient. Uh, if you take a wave and it focuses at one point, um, then right after it focuses, it's going to spread out again, and it, it, it will spread out. So, um, so while focusing can happen, it can't happen very often. Um, um, and you know, every, time, every time two waves focus, uh, like the, if, so any time two bits of energy come together, they should then go apart and never, and never interact again. Um, and so while you can create a lot of focusing at one time, if you average over time, you should get a lot less uh, focusing on average than you do in the worst case scenario. Um, and so this is a phenomenon called local smoothing. Um, and it, it means that even though waves can temporarily be very, very bad, um, they are actually fairly smooth. They, 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 they kind of smooth, um, they, they have um, smooth solutions for most times, just there's a few bad times where you can't control anything. Um, and so uh, if you actually want to analyze these equations, and particularly if you want to perturb them and analyze more complicated, like nonlinear versions of these equations, it's very important that you actually quantify precisely how much local smoothing you have. Um, and uh, so that, that sort of quantifies how much regularity you expect to lose at, at short times. Um, and then by rescaling, uh, this is, it's very closely related to what called time decay estimates. It's just, it, it, it's just how much decay can you have over long times. It, it's, it's almost the same question. Um, so, uh, <laughs> to summarize a hundred of years of wave harmonic analysis and wave equations, uh, people have basically been proving lots and lots of local smoothing and time decay estimates. Um, I will not survey all of them, that is impossible. Um, to mention uh, one that I quite like, um, which is uh, one of the first ones actually. It's the, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the, the Moravitz estimate. Um, First introduced, well, it's a, there's, there's a whole family of Moravitz estimates, but uh, it was introduced by Kathleen Moravitz uh, back in the 60s uh, using what we now call the Moravitz multiplier method. Um, so um, basically what Moravitz did was she um, modified energy conservation. Um, to, uh, so you know, energy is conserved. So she, she looked at uh, modified energies where she treats incoming waves and outgoing waves differently. So she multiplies the solution by a certain multiplier. Uh, to favor, uh, I think uh, the way it works is uh, um, incoming waves get a negative weight, 
uh, ways that so say, say go to, towards the origin in a negative way, but ways that go out, away from the origin get a positive way. Uh, and by weighting the energy, it's no longer conserved. Um, but what she shows is it's actually increasing. Um, that basically the thing about waves is that waves can go inwards, they can go towards the origin, and they can go outwards away from the origin. Um, and they can, uh, and you can transition from inward to outward. If a wave is going towards the origin, it can pass through or fly by, and then it will, be, it will go outward. But the reverse never happens. If a wave is already going outgoing, it will never somehow come back and become ingoing. Right? I mean, if there's boundaries and so forth, then maybe yes. But, if, but for the free wave equation without boundaries, ingoing maps to outgoing, but not vice versa. So she was able to quantify a weighted version of, of, of energy, which, which um, uh, weights incoming and outgoing is, um, differently. And she could show that this was not conserved, but it was increasing over time. And, uh, but she could also show it was bounded. Uh, it, it, the way she weighted it, it's basically bounded by the energy. This is a bit of a lie, but this is roughly speaking true. Um, and um, so it's increasing, but it can't increase too much. Um, but uh, every, time it, every time the wave, went, uh, but she could also show that every time the wave went near the origin, um, it would flip some of the energy from incoming to outgoing. And so you couldn't have too much energy um, too, much, too much of the wave at the origin over long periods of time because that would keep um, making her, her multiply, uh, her weighted energy keep going up, but it has to stay bounded. So if you put all this together, uh, you can prove uh, these, these Moravitz estimates. Uh, and there's, there's a bunch of them, and, and they're all kind of useful. Um, here's one of the simplest ones. Uh, if you have a three-dimensional wave um, of, a, of finite energy, um, then um, there's a, there was some time decay at the spatial origin. So if you, if you just look only at the origin and you just look at, at what the wave is doing at the spatial origin, um, over time, the wave will, will dissipate. Um, that uh, um, um, it, it cannot stay high amplitude for long periods of time. It must actually, actually decay uh, in the sense that its total integral must actually be finite. Um, Right, which, which corresponds to our experience. You know, we, we know from Huygens' principle, for example, that if you have a disturbance in three dimensions, eventually the wave will move away from the origin and you don't see it anymore. Um, but um, the beauty of this estimate is that um, you don't need to be localized at the origin in order for this. Your wave could, could, could have all kinds of, of waves going in and out, and it could focus at various times, but this estimate is always true. Um, and it's a great estimate. Um, that, um, what's powerful about this method is that it actually even works even for nonlinear equations. Not all nonlinear equations, but there are many nonlinear wave equations for which this method actually works, and it's extremely useful. Um, lots of our understanding of, uh, of, uh, of nonlinear wave equations will not be possible, actually, without the Moravis estimates. And uh, OK, well, not just, I mean, she invented the first few, but the, the, the next hundred or so <laughs> of what we rely on. OK. All right, so uh, that's sort of, uh, that's 20th century uh, local smoothing. Um, um, but okay, I mean, um, there were other estimates that people wanted but uh, couldn't prove. Um, so there's, there's something called Sog's local smoothing conjecture, uh, which uh, only got solved a few years ago. Um, so that's kind of the 21st century component. Um, so uh, I'm running a little bit low on time, actually. Um, all right, yeah, it's, it's motivated uh, from a theorem in analysis, which maybe I will not talk about. It's, it's called the, the big differentiation theorem. Uh, it was actually, it's, uh, um, okay, yeah, it, it's, uh, uh, maybe I will not uh, tell you about this theorem, uh, but it's, uh, um, yeah, it, it relates a function, uh, it tells you that it, an average function can be approximated by, by its sort of local averages of that function. It's a very basic theorem in, uh, in analysis, um, but, it's, uh, but in order for this theorem to work, it, it had to average over these balls. Um, and there was this long-standing question uh, for a while, what happens if you average in different ways? And so people were studying what happened. Uh, if, can you approximate a function by its average, say, over circles rather than balls? Um, and uh, this you can also do. Uh, and this was done by, famously by Bourgain in 1968. Uh, it's called Bourgain's Circular Maximal Theorem. In fact, it was so well regarded. I think it was also even cited in his few amount of citations, one of the things he did. Um, that he was able to show um, that, that uh, an approximation theorem for uh, that any function can be uh, can be approximated by by circular averages, as, as given a certain integrability condition, which I won't talk about. Um, as it was a very difficult argument um, using a lot of geometric analysis, which actually anticipated a lot of the modern work that, that we do nowadays. But at the time, it was it was really quite a shocking, like really hardcore piece of piece of analysis. Um, uh, there was a simpler proof given by Chris Sog uh, later. Um, that he realized that actually these questions of circular averages are actually um, closely related to the wave equation. You know, that, uh, 
that uh, um, you know, waves propagate out in circles um, in two dimensions, pretty much. And so conversely, if you want to know what a solution is doing at time t, um, you have to know what, what is going on. You can, you can propagate backwards in time, and there'll be a slow circle. And what the wave is doing on that circle will tell you what the wave is doing now. Um, and he could rewrite um, Bourgain's circular maximum theorem in terms of the wave equation, and he reproved it. Um, and by doing so, he realized actually that um, maybe he could actually do prove something stronger than than uh, um, than Bourgain's circular maximum theorem. And uh, he was eventually led to this conjecture, uh, which okay, uh, yeah, if you don't know what a sum of those spaces, uh, this conjecture won't very mean very much. But it's 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 a local smoothing estimate. It, it tells you some control of your solution at 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 local, at local time, say times region one and two, in terms of what the solution is doing at time zero. Um, and you lose some derivatives. Uh, so this is alpha, which, which represents how many derivatives you lose in this estimate. But the amazing thing with, with this conjecture is that you, you lose almost nothing. Um, almost any other estimate for um, the wave equation loses at least you know, some positive number of derivatives. Uh, like the Moravitz estimate that I just showed you loses uh, one, uh, one full derivative. But this is an estimate that it, it, it loses uh, almost no derivatives. Um, you can take any alpha as small as you wish, and this estimate is supposed to be true. Uh, so it was a very bold conjecture, um, and at the time there's sort of no real reason why it should be true. Um, and in fact, uh, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, I thought I okay, um, but yeah, it was solved uh, in 2019 actually by Larry Guth, Hong Wang, and Wu Shang Zhang uh, by a very nice argument. Um, at least in two dimensions, we we uh, understand the conjecture. In three and higher, we still don't know, and there's actually very good reasons why we don't know uh, this conjecture. But uh, uh, but it is actually solved now. Um, but it's, um, yeah, the, the proof goes through all kinds of other mathematics, which uh, um, the connections to which have been understood for years now. But it's, it's always a surprise when you first see it. You know, these questions about waves, they're actually inherently geometric problems. Uh, well, at least they have a very large geometric, geometric component. Um, and they're tied in particular to a very classical problem uh, called the Kikia needle problem. So this is it's the following problem that if you take um, a unit needle in the plane, um, and you want to turn it around um, by 180 degrees. You want to rotate the needle on the plane. Uh, the question is, what, what's the smallest amount of area you need in order to, to turn the needle around? Um, so you know, you could just turn it around by by a um, you know in a circular motion, and that will give you like pi over four area or something. Um, but you know, you know, just like uh, if you want to get a, park, a tight parking spot, you can maybe try to three point U turn or something, um, and uh, you can you can move around what's called a, a deltoid shape, which technically is pi over eight area rather than pi over four. You can you can conserve some area by, by being um, smarter with uh, your parallel parking. Um, uh, why you would do that? Well, okay, but um, all right. Um, but um, actually, it turns out that if you, uh, instead of a three-point U-turn, you do a five-point or seven-point. If you, if, you, if, you, if you do like lots of little, little turns, uh, it turns out that actually you, you can turn a needle around using arbitrarily small area. Um, that there is a way, um, uh, so there are these things called Kikea sets. Uh, Kikea set is a set that contains a unit line segment in, in every direction. And these are basically, um, roughly speaking, these are sets in which it's possible to do a very fancy parallel parking maneuver and turn um, a needle around. And you can use as little area as you wish. Um, so uh, these were constructed by Bezikovich first uh, back in the early 20th century. Um, and um, these turn out to be connected to local smoothing. Um, so, uh, for example, there's this, there's this little epsilon loss of derivatives in, in, in this conjecture. Um, and you could be really optimistic and say that maybe there's no loss of derivatives at all. Maybe the conjecture is true and, and with, with alpha equals zero. Uh, but it was shown by Tom Wolfe in 99 in, um, in that uh, this doesn't happen because of these KK sets. Um, and why is there a connection? Um, it's because they think called wave trains. Um, so, um, we're seeing these plane waves which are completely spread out in, 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 in space. But there are these localized versions of plane waves which are called wave trains. They, 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 they're like plane waves localized to a, a little rectangle. And they just move like a train um, for some period of time before dispersing. Um, but it's possible to localize a, a wave train to um, a little rectangle, which you should think of as being like a needle. Um, and using these care sets, it's possible to get a whole bunch of, of wave trains, which initially at time zero are very far apart from each other, very spatially separated. But as they move in, they, they, they slide into this Kikea set where they all overlap with each other very heavily. Um, and they overlap for quite a, a long period of time. So it's, it's not like these focusing examples where just, there's, there's an instant where they focus and they spread out. These trains, they take a long time to pass through the, um, the Kikea set. So there's actually a long period of time for which they're, they're concentrated. And so, um, so 
the um, averaging time doesn't actually get you any more smoothing. Um, and so you can show that, that you, you do not have perfect local smoothing. The existence of K sets actually tells you that, that perfect local smoothing is not possible. But this turns out to somehow be the only, so, so what Guth, Wang, and Zhang showed is that this is somehow the, the only obstruction that, that apart from these weird K set type examples, um, the rest is actually local smoothing. Um, um, yeah, but to do that, you have to understand the K conjecture better. Uh, but fortunately, two dimensions we actually do have a pretty good, good understanding. Um, and then there's, there's all these intermediate conjectures uh, uh, between K and local smoothing you have to understand as well. Um, so I'm running out of time. So I won't uh, uh, say, okay, so one of my first papers actually was to, uh, to understand that the connections between all these conjectures is a paper of mine from 99 where I, I proved a bunch of, of implications between various conjectures. You see local smoothing at the top and the Kakea sets are at the bottom and then there's always other ones that I don't want to talk about. Um, okay, so maybe I will, uh, all right, I was going to talk about the number theory connections, but maybe I think uh, I'm out of time now. So maybe this is a good, good time to stop. So, thank you.